Hi, I'm Sandy Baird and I'm here tonight to discuss immigration issues, particularly important, we all believe, because the new president, President Biden, is considering changing much of the immigration uh, procedures, much of some of the laws around immigration. We don't know what he's going to do, but he did promise reform uh, for people who were in the country, either not citizens or people coming across the border. And so with me tonight is an immigration attorney, Kurt Maida, who practices in Burlington, Vermont. And he will explain a little bit about the most, about basic information uh, that pertains to immigration and also maybe discuss a little bit about what we should expect from President Biden. So let's begin, Kurt. There's a lot of discussion. Um, as you know, I have an office over at the Association of Americans Living in Vermont, who by the way are partners on this series. A lot of confusion in the, in the new Americans that I see around the terms that are used, also with, with US people as well, around the terms that are used in, uh, in immigration procedures. For instance, uh, many people have what are known as visas, I guess, to be in the United States. So maybe you could say what a visa is. Yeah, okay, great. So uh, Sandy, thanks for having me. And I wanna take this opportunity to thank the uh, Vermont Institute of International and Community Involvement for sponsoring this series. Uh, it was originally titled uh, Immigration in the Biden Administration, What Are the Expectations? Question mark. And uh, uh, Sandy, I, Sandy and I had a conversation this afternoon and what we thought would be a lot more helpful would be to lay a basic foundation for all of our viewers, uh, not just the immigrants, not just Americans, but uh, everyone watching and uh, having an idea as to what different types of immigration categories, what they are, what they aren't, so that we could begin to have a, a, a more informed dialogue mm -hmm. uh, about this topic. So let me just start out by, um, giving you a, a brief introduction into the different types of people that are around us, you know, that uh, using immigration classifications. Sure. So, right. uh, so I'm just going to give you, I know everyone loves lists, so I'm going to give you a list of seven different categories that I uh, put together of people that I think for the most part, and sometimes it's messy, it's not neat, but for the most part, everyone around us fall into these categories. So the first category, you know, really simple is a US citizen. So I, I think most of the folks that we have online watching this live right now probably would fall into that category, US American citizens. Uh, I know from my, from my uh, perspective, there's, there's two different ways that you can arrive at US citizenship. The, the most obvious one is being born in the United States uh, anytime after the year 1789, which I think that's all of us. Uh, and the second way to become a US citizen is uh, the process by which I became a US citizen my, myself as an immigrant was going filing an application with the immigration office and going through something called a naturalization process, which is allowed for in the constitution of the United States, which allows me to have basically all the same rights that uh, except everyone, one. except one, and I'm going to name that. Right. right. Ex except all, except for becoming uh, the U.S. president, right. uh, I, I basically enjoy all the same rights that the folks that are watching this live right now on this program have. But aside from that, in theory, you know, uh, all U.S. citizens have the same rights. The exception being is if I acquired my citizenship through a fraudulent matter, if I lied on my application. You know, if you look on a naturalization or citizenship application, there'll be all kinds of questions about, you know, one's history, if they wanna become a US citizen, from questions such as, you know, whether or not they've committed crimes in the past, whether or not they have engaged in prostitution, have belonged to the US, I mean, US or any other communist party, or whether they were members of the 1930, prior to 1933 or after 1933, uh, a, a close associate or a, an affiliate of the, 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 the Nazi regime in Germany. Uh, if you fall into the, some of these various categories, you are excluded from becoming a US citizen. 
Still, uh, still. Still, correct. Yeah, you're wow. not allowed to be a communist. You're not allowed to be, you know, a bigamist. You're not allowed to have engaged in prostitution or illegal gambling. All these things are considered bars to becoming an American citizen. Of course, once you become an American citizen, you can do a lot of these things. Or if you're born in this country, you can do all of those things. Uh, and obviously, you're not going to well, lose your citizenship. Can I stop yeah. you right there? Sure. Isn't it, it's quite difficult to lose your citizenship, actually, isn't it? It happens uh, on, you know, it's very exceptional ex right. under extraordinary circumstances uh, where uh, people lose their citizenship. The easiest example I can probably point to, Sandy, is uh, that you see in the news, not so much anymore, but, you know, even up until the last 10 to 20, 30 years, were individuals who were later found out to be former Nazis yes. in the regime in Europe, uh, who did not disclose that upon coming into the United States and someone recognized them on the street somewhere or someone did some kind of a search and found out that they were, you know, concentration camp guards or members or officials in the, in the Nazi party. And often in those cases, there have been uh, situations where extradition proceedings often started people were deported to Germany typically and prosecuted in Germany. And in the process, Sandy, they would lose their US citizenship. But it's usually, it's very extraordinary for people right. to lose citizenship. Thank, so, thank heavens, that's, that, that, that's a very good uh, yeah. thing, very good value. But let me ask you about Meir Kahani. Remember, remember sure. him? Yes. Um, yeah. He tried to lose his citizenship at one right. point, didn't he? He denounced the United States. He served yeah. in the Israeli Knesset. Right. He, you know, really said, I don't want to be a U.S. citizen anymore. Yeah. And he changed and he was, I think it was taken away. Is that correct? Briefly? I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if he was actually denaturalized as the process it's, it is called. I think he uh, was a U.S. citizen by birth. By birth. Yeah. Oh, the right. only example that I can point to of a U.S. citizen by birth losing their citizenship was a man named Rene Gonzalez. He was yeah. a he was he was born in the United States. He was born in Chicago, right, and he was right. part of the uh, a group called the Cuban Five. Right, exactly. And he was arrested in the United States for spying for the Cuban regime. He he was born here and then moved moved to Cuba as a child. And when Mr. Gonzalez, uh, after he was arrested in the United States for espionage, one of the conditions for his release from uh, incarceration was that he would have to agree to giving up his U.S. citizenship. Yeah despite having been born in Chicago to parents who were also US citizens, but of Cuban descent. So very few examples where people that lose their citizen, citizenship when they were actually born here. Well, one other example that I know too is, a, is another one concerning Cuba. I think Margaret Randall, you guys know Margaret Randall, Joanne is here with us, or uh, Beth or Lou. Margaret Randall was a poet and she was involved in the 60s. That's why I thought we, you might know her. She moved to Cuba and de again, denounced her citizenship and thought she had given it up and then changed her mind and came yeah. back and had to sue in a court and did that. And the court decision was that you cannot, even if you denounce the United States or you say you don't want it, you don't lose your citizenship. You don't lose it. Another but, notable example, uh, which I think most people will know was uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, he, he went to the, uh, the Russian embassy in Mexico City prior okay. to the assassination of President Kennedy and attempted to renounce his U.S. citizenship, but was not successful in renouncing right. it. Right. So, uh, so I want to move on. Uh, so that was the first of seven categories. Joanne has a question. Is that right? Who had a question? I do. Yeah. Kirk, can I ask you a quick question? You said you yeah. can't be, a, if you are applying to be a citizen, if you say that you have been involved in prostitution? Does that mean if you're a prostitute or could you have hired a prostitute? Uh, the, the question as it appears right now on the application is whether you've engaged in prostitution. So typically, you know, I think disproportionately, I guess it would probably affect, uh, you know, I, I know there are male prostitutes also, but I think disproportionately, it would probably impact women, uh, okay. that question. The way it's a, the way it's written, it almost sounds like if you engaged in it, if you hired yeah. a prostitute, yeah, but probably not. Now, I think the way it's interpreted typically is for the person selling their body yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in exchange for uh, uh, for money. Right. 
Okay. Uh, so I, yeah, sure. So I want to move on. So there's seven categories that we want to just briefly touch upon. So U.S. citizens, that's probably the most familiar one to us. The next one is a green card holder, also known as a permanent resident or a lawful permanent resident. A green card holder is someone who basically can do most of the things that U.S. citizens can do, except except they cannot vote. One of the most notable exceptions to the category of things you can do that citizens uh, that citizens can do. Uh, you, you are not allowed to vote as a permanent resident. You're allowed to live in the United States and you're not, to, you're not allowed to leave the United States for a period of more than 12 months. Right, right. If you leave the country for more than 12 months and try to re-enter the United States, uh, you may be questioned by an immigration officer at the airport or at a land border and may be given a difficult time. Uh, there is a way that you can do make uh, arrangements to leave the country in excess of 12 months, but you have to do it in, in advance and get an authorization from the US uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services, you know, known as the Immigration Office, and you can actually secure that. But if you do, if you do leave the country for more than 12 months and do it without permission, you can expect having trouble uh, coming back into the country. Okay. So permanent residents or green card holders, you know, synonymous terms, uh, that can be acquired uh, a couple of different ways. Uh, we have a few different uh, processes through which someone can get a green card and it's actually a card that happens to be green uh, and it has a photo of a person on it, the, of the individual that's the holder, as well as when they receive the green card, uh, that's important, that date is put on it and the category under which they came into the United States. And it has things like height and weight and uh, um, some other basic information about the person as well as the person's signature. So uh, one of the ways that someone gets a green card is uh, by a family member applying for them. Uh, it, there's four categories under which uh, someone can apply for a family member to come to the United States and get a green card. The person either has to be a spouse, a child, a parent, or a sibling. That's it. If you don't fall neatly within one of those categories, and they could be stepkids uh, also, uh, they do allow for that. But if you don't otherwise fall neatly within these categories, uh, these four, four different sets of categories, you will not be able to apply for someone to come here. So no boyfriends, girlfriends, aunts, uncles, grandparents, Sorry, they do not fall within those categories. How about fiance? I thought uh, that, there, that I'm going to get to that sh yeah, shortly, okay. but that's not a uh, uh, that's not someone who gets a green card right off the uh -huh. bat when they get to uh -huh. the airport. The second way someone can get a green card is uh, through employment. So mm -hmm. if you have some kind of skill, typically these days these skills tend to be limited to folks that classify their uh, background in in STEM in the STEM field. Uh, so, um, you know, high tech, high education, you know, anything like that, uh, you can apply if a, if a company, an American company or a government office or an agency or a nonprofit uh, hears about you if you're in another country and you apply through them, they can secure a green card for you. They have to establish first that they can't find a similarly qualified American they also have to, uh, or, or American citizen or green card holder who's already here. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they also have to promise that they're going to pay you what's known as a prevailing wage, which by prevailing wage, different from minimum wage, it's the wage that's typically paid for someone in that industry. Uh -huh. So if you're a, for a simple example, you know, computer programmer, uh, and a computer programmer with similar qualifications will get paid fifty or sixty thousand dollars. That company sponsoring that potential immigrant, they would have to promise that they're going to be paying that person fifty to sixty thousand dollars, and they have to do so for that person to continue to stay here. Otherwise, they can't. Uh, a third way that a person can get a green card uh, and come into the United States is through a system called a visa. Uh, I'm sorry, a green card lottery program. A uh, green card lottery program literally uh, chooses a bunch of countries that are underrepresented in the United States uh, through their immigrant populations and people will apply from those countries. It's typically countries where individuals 
for the most part, either just don't apply to come here or that often they don't have the means to even come here. Uh, so it's not the typical person from, you know, China, India, the Philippines, but it'll be, you know, someone for, from uh, Mongolia or uh -huh. a uh, country, you know, that you don't typically associate with high numbers of immigrants in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. So this immigrant visa lottery program, which is literally like a lottery, uh, because I've had clients who've gotten that and they said out of the blue, they got a letter from the uh, from the U.S. Embassy saying, you know, after they applied, of course, that they've been selected in this lottery uh, and were able to come here. Mm -hmm. uh, just as an aside, uh, my when my father originally came to the United States, he came in a program that was somewhat similar to that in the late 1960s. And when, he came at that, from India, he, right? He came from India back at a time where that was a rare thing. You didn't see too many people from that country in the United States. Now that's not the case anymore, but that was in the 1960s. So on a personal note, Kurt, when, yeah. how old were you when you came? Uh, 10 months. 10 months, so you never, yeah. knew, you never knew India really? No, no, not, not until I went back there when I was 11 yeah. for, for a summer. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. Did so, you like it? Did you like it? Uh, not at the time. It was just too different for me. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I, I missed my baseball, my, you know, my, my, my soda and all the other bad things that I was used to doing. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So go. I'm going to move along then. Uh, so yeah, after, uh, after green cards, the next uh, category of person that may be in your presence, if you're out there outside, is something that a lot of us Vermonters are typically familiar with, and those are uh, asylees or refugees. Uh, these groups typically come into the United States. There are pretty strict um, uh, quotas on how many uh, asylees and refugees come into the United States. During the last presidential administration, the number was reduced to 15,000 a year. Uh, the Biden presidency, we'll talk about this a little later, but they're trying to up that number to 125,000. And typically it's been closer to 100,000 in previous administration prior to President Trump's administration on an annual basis. So people that come on a refugee basis or on, you know, as an prospective uh, asylum seeker, their goal typically is to eventually get a green card, the prior category we just talked about, and then move on to citizenship. One thing I just wanted to finish mentioning about green cards is if people have their green card for five years mm -hmm. uh, without any other, without any issues coming up, if they choose to, they can then apply for American citizenship, uh, which is again, uh, on a personal note, that's something that you know I did as a kid. Uh, so fi after five years, uh, you can actually acquire US citizenship if you have a green card. So were you uh, a minor when you uh, became a citizen? Do they let minors or do you have to go through? Yeah, sure. Family? So the rule typically is, is if, if a parent, right. if, if an adult has children and the children are under the age of 16, when the adult applies for citizenship and gets it, because the requirement is you have to pass, uh, pass yeah. an exam right. where you have to demonstrate that you can speak, read, write English and also, um, um, have a, uh, oh, and no, no, uh, basics about us history, which has over the years have, has gotten a little bit more and more involved, uh, mm -hmm. to the point where I think they've done studies and they indicate that most American adults yeah, right. could not even, you know, pa pass, pass the exams anymore. Right. But so you have to go through that and go through a, a fingerprint background search to uh, make sure that you haven't been involved in any criminal activity for individuals over the age of 14. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was obviously exempt from that as a child. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that's that's how a child can, can become a citizen. If the parents become citizens and the child is under the age of 16, mm -hmm. through the application, the kids automatically become US citizens. Uh, so uh, we, we talked about asylum seekers, yeah. uh, refugees, and then we're gonna move on to the next category which are non-immigrant visa holders. And typically that's where I get the most amount of confusion from friends and other people that I, acquaintances, as well as fellow attorneys. 
uh, they don't know quite what that is. And it's a pretty broad category. They're, it's called non-immigrant visa holders. So what, what is that? So that can be a person who's coming to see Disneyland from France, mm -hmm. that, which is a visitor. That could be a student learn, teach, I mean, uh, taking exams at UVM uh, from, from a foreign country. So someone on a student visa. Uh, again, that doesn't, all that allows them to do is study. A visitor, all that allows them to do is visit as a tourist. And those, those visas for tourists are typically three months unless you try to extend them, which then that can be six months and that can be extended again. Uh, student visas, uh, as we have a lot of students at Champlain College and at UVM uh, from many countries around the world, uh, they're allowed to stay up until their education is completed. Uh, they're not allowed to work. They're not allowed oh. to earn income unless yeah. they actually get special permission from the government, from, from the immigration service to, to get a job. Uh, it could be at the school bookstore or it has to be something on the, on the campus you know, they can't go to Church Street. You know, we're speaking from Burlington, Vermont here. So uh, they can't go on Church Street and work at Starbucks or, or the outdoor gear exchange. Uh, not allowed. It has to be something related to the educational institution that they're attending. Uh, other non-visa, uh, non-immigrant visa categories are things like, yeah. Can I have an ask a question? So the visa, sure. this was very conf confusing when we've dealt with Cuba, for instance. The okay. visa comes from the host government, correct? Like a visa. The United, meaning the United States. Right. So the United Meaning the United States, States in our, our situation, correct. correct. Issues the visa. Yes. To the person who wants to come for a temporary stay, correct? Yeah, yeah. So good question, Sandy. So just to give people a little bit of an idea what that means, that, you know, that haven't had the ability to tr do a lot of traveling uh you know this is a the, the 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 immigration process is a partnership uh between the uscis which is the government agency it used to be called ins a long time ago but it's uscis now uh the department of homeland security and we have a whole system of consulates throughout the world embassies that represent american interests in pretty much every country in the world except for cuba <laughs> Uh, right now. now they do we have a US yeah agency. yeah except yeah. yeah it's just a couple of janitors and cops yeah. there right now right yeah but for the <laughs> right but for the most part yeah we have an embassy in, in most countries and one of the things embassies do aside from helping american citizens who are traveling is that's where the preliminary interview takes place when you have a foreign person who's trying to immigrate to the united states so you know if i'm you know myself and I'm from India and I want to come to the United States and I've applied and all my applications have been approved, then I would go to an interview at the American embassy in that country, right. so whether it's India, China, Russia, wherever it is, it doesn't right. matter, but I would, I would go into a building and be interviewed by an American consular officer who would check to make sure that everything on my application to come to the United States was correct or and uh to make sure that i am who i claim to be uh right. and don't pose a threat to the uh to the mainland of the united states when i get here uh so and then they literally uh give you a stamp in your passport the american visa system also has your photograph in it right that they just stick into your passport and it has a bunch of all kinds of numbers and how long the visa is good for and when it's when it was issued and when you're supposed to come back and it's got an electronic photograph of the individual except if you come from uh western europe or uh japan or a couple of other countries that are basically for lack of a better description are known as being the wealthy countries that don't require a visa for a person from that country to come to the united states so if you're from france germany anywhere from scandinavia from japan from New Zealand, and you want to go to Disney World in Florida, you buy a ticket and you just come. Right. You don't have to get interviewed by anyone. Right. You know, Canada, the same thing. You don't get interviewed. But if you come from China, if you come from India, if you come from you know a developing country or even Eastern Europe, parts of Eastern Europe, uh, you have to go physically to a building and be interviewed and you can be approved or you can be denied. Right. And then you'll get that stamp in your passport with your picture allowing you to come. Uh, so different sets of rules for countries that are considered 
more well off where individuals are less likely to come here and decide, hey, I'm just going to stay here. Right. Uh, because, right. you know, economically right. we're better off. Yeah, Grant. A, a term that I find is a lot of confusion about also is, uh, and it might be a minor point, but an embassy versus a consulate. Yeah. Because it's yeah. the same thing. Right. Uh, typically the same thing, uh, with few exceptions, few exceptions, but it's typically the same thing. Except that an embassy isn't it in the capital of that other country. It has the ambassador. That's where the ambassador is, right? Yeah, but they, they they do have branch embassies yeah. in yeah. in countries where there's uh, where the countries are quite large, yeah. in some cases, and in con in countries where a single embassy simply cannot do the job uh, because there's a fair amount of immigration, or the country geographically is very large. Right. Uh, and that goes both ways. In the United States, we have uh, certain certain foreign countries embassies, or some are located on the west coast and on the east coast. Yeah. Uh, because of the size of our country. Right. Uh, so, and that pertains to situations overseas where the U.S. will have multiple embassies in countries that are very large. Right. Right. Uh, so, uh, uh, just finishing up non-immigrant visas. Uh, so you have. You know, people like students, au pairs, fashion models, uh, business visas, people that come and get a, a that are, that are uh, sponsored by employers who don't sponsor them to come here to live here permanently, like one of the methods by which you can get a green card, but temporarily, they may want someone, a computer programmer for three years, mm -hmm. or, and, and that person completes their assignment and goes back. Uh, Vermont has, a, has had a system in the past where we used to get uh, a lot of agricultural workers from the country of Jamaica, from the island of Jamaica right, in the right. summer. And they would, they would come here in the summer, uh, work here, and then they would typically, they would go back uh, mm -hmm. in compliance with uh, visa terms that they came on. So there's different categories of uh, these non-immigrant visas where they're supposed to be temporary in nature. So that could be based on work, studying, um, um, uh, the, the other thing I mentioned, uh, visiting, uh, and as well as they even have things like religious visas, yeah. where, you know, um, pastors, priests, uh, um, rabbis come here for a short period of time and work at a church or a synagogue and uh, then go back. How about uh, imams? Any moms, correct. Really? correct. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's a category. And then Finally, we're gonna to get to two categories that are often in the news quite a bit and will continue to be in the news uh, in the next coming months. Those are for people that, uh, and I, I don't wanna get into the semantics of the terms. Some people call them undocumented, some people call them illegal, some people call them unauthorized. Uh, however, all, th all of these, these names that I mentioned, they're all folks that, uh, are in the United States and don't have the authority to legally be here, uh, either because they came here legally with a visa. I'll give you a quick example. Like, let's say someone coming to study at UVM, they finish their studies and decide, you know what? I think I like it here. I'm, I like Vermont. I don't think I'm gonna go back mm -hmm. and I'll figure out what I need to do. That's a situation where someone is documented. They came here with the proper documents and they complied with their requirements for the stay, except they didn't go back, but right. they still have their passport. They still have their expired visa. They may have even acquired a legal driver's license in the process, but they're not supposed to be here. Uh, this uh, Another type of person who falls within that category is someone who uh, through either fraud or through a means such as crossing a land border or, or sneaking onto a plane gets into the country and they're what you would classically call undocumented. They right. often don't have passports. They right. don't have any other right. documentation uh, verifying their background or where they're from or anything about them. And uh, that is a major part of the discussion that we're gonna have right. today and that, that our country is gonna have in the coming months and our country had during the prior administration. Right. There's, right. There's approximately 11 to 12 million people wow. that fall into that latter category of people either whose visas expired and they decided to just stay uh, and they work here, you know, and I'm going to use the pejorative term, but I, I don't have another word 
at, at my, 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 you know, tip of my tongue illegally. They're working here illegally without author authorization. Right. Uh, and, and people that are undocumented who also are working here without the authorization to work. Uh, so we've got 11 to 12 million people in that category. Uh, we're going to transition the conversation into what the topic of today's talk was going to be, which is, you know, what the Biden administration is going to allegedly do uh, think, in that situation. Does, any, does anyone else have questions? Yeah. About? Okay. Yeah. Any question about the seven categories that I talked about? I think it was seven. No, Joanne? So, there. Um, Lou does. Lou does, I guess. Lou. An asylum seeker, Kurt, an yeah. asylum seeker, what does an asylum seeker do? They cross the border and say, I want asylum. Yeah, there's a couple of different ways. Uh, so that's one example, uh, probably one of the most common in terms of, you know, uh, if you took a poll, if you counted the population, someone crosses the border, uh, they're required to state their intent to claim asylum. And what, then, was the other, what was the other category you said? Asylum seekers and what are in Refugees. That? Refugee, okay. okay. Refugees. Uh, I, so that was one category that I, I combined. The asylum so, must state a, de a desire to seek asylum. Correct. They have to do that within 12 months. I see. Uh, that was something that was uh, instituted during the Clinton administration. Hmm. Prior to that, people were able to make that declaration even after 12 months. Uh, but during uh, the Clinton administration, they passed uh, a set of immigration reforms and they wanted to tighten some things up. And one of the things that they did is they required that in order for an individual to successfully seek asylum in the United States and to eventually get their case approved for asylum and then eventually a green card and maybe eventually after that becoming US citizens, um, that person, when they get here, they have to, within 12 months, uh, file the paperwork with the immigration service stating that they, uh, they are going to seek asylum. But if how they're do they caught... get over the border? How do they get yeah. over the border in the first place? Uh, okay, so good question, Sandy. So there are a number of ways. Uh, in many cases, uh, when we're talking about the southern border, right. and actually in 20 years ago, even the northern border more right. so, but literally by walking across the border. Right. Uh, you know, a big part of the conversation over the last four years was securing the Southern border and to right. develop, you know, what was hopefully gonna be an impenetrable uh, border wall right. uh, uh, along the Southern border because that was, it was noted that that was the, where the largest number of these undocumented, Im un undocumented immigrants were coming in from. The thinking was that if there was an impenetrable border uh, that the numbers would be uh, greatly reduced. That was the uh, that was the objective of the uh, Trump administration's immigration policy right. with respect to uh, border security. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, what what happened? There was only 47 miles of additional new border wall construction that happened, and uh, out of the 1,800 mile border that we have with Mexico there was already 450 miles of border that was already in place at different spots that we have. Notably, I mean, I, you know, I crossed into Tijuana, Mexico from San Diego. So there was a, a wall there even 20, 30 years ago. Uh -huh. uh, so some of those walls were forti further fortified during the, the prior administration, during, you know, the, the Trump administration. But in terms of new wall that was created, uh, the total uh, barrier put up was about 47 additional miles on top of the 450 that were previously existed and maybe in poor repair. So that was uh, fixed up. Right, but that has been stopped. That was one of the executive so, orders, right? Correct, correct. So when the when the new president came in, uh, mm -hmm. they're ceasing any further construction of this border wall, the objective of which was to cross the uh, entire, to place a barrier across the entire southern border Right. which would uh, amount to about 1,800 miles right. uh, with, with Mexico. Maybe. I heard that they weren't honoring that, though, that, that they, were, um, they were still stopping people. Well, they well, can they, stop people. No, they're supposed yeah. to stop people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that is, you know, regardless of the administration that's in power, uh, it's always been the, uh, the, uh, the uh, well, you can call it the goal or the, uh, the rules in place that individuals are stopped. Uh, we're just talking about a physical barrier 
being constructed and expanded upon. I see. That, that, the, that the new president via executive order stopped funding towards new construction. I did hear though, that there was a lawsuit against that, by the way. And yeah, they, yeah. They, I mean, chances are there. with m most of these things on both sides, whether it was President Trump putting through executive orders or Obama before him, and I'm sure when Biden puts them, there will be lawsuits in the federal courts, right. uh, regardless of the uh, party in power that will attempt to challenge what Biden does, and they attempted to challenge what Trump did previously. Uh, so uh, I wanted to transition into some of the, so now that we have an idea of some of these different categories of individuals that are in our country, all of us, for the most part, fall into one of those categories, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what the Biden administration is trying to attempt to do in some cases expanding upon and some in some cases going in the polar opposite direction that the uh, that the Trump administration uh, was going in. Uh, Sandy started out by mentioning, you know, one thing was the border wall construction that the president is uh, the new president uh, via executive order is stopping further funding of. Uh, so likely that will probably not the further construction will probably not happen. I also wanted to make the conversation a little bit more political in that talking about from my perspective, what goals are reachable and what goals are I think are gonna be a little far-fetched and difficult politically for a new administration to accomplish in the, in the realm of immigration. Uh, another thing that the Biden administration has uh, talked about is uh, expanding upon the Deferred Action Program. Right. Right. Uh, most folks will know that program by the term that was coined I think 10 years ago, they, they call them dreamers. Right. Dreamers are basically people that children, for the most part, or they were children at one point when they were brought into the United States, uh, either unauthorized, illegally, or with a visa, and they have visas that have since expired. Uh, again, in short, you know, indiv individuals and younger folks, for the most part, that, uh, that are not technically supposed to be here according to US immigration law. Uh, the thinking behind an executive order that President Obama put forth in 2012 was that these young individuals had benefited from uh, American educations. Uh, a, significant, a significant investment had already been made uh, for them by being in this country and receiving different types of benefits, including an education, and that uh, at that point, since they don't, they did, they don't, and didn't know of any other country, uh, why not give them some kind of legal status right. and allow them to become contributing taxpayers? Uh, and just to clarify, the assumption now is that President Trump was against that program, and actually, that's 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 false. When the when uh, President Trump came and when his administration did come into power. Uh, the president at that time, Trump, indicated that he did support the program. Uh, he wanted to negotiate a, an overall border security and comprehensive immigration reform package with the Democrats that were in power and then work towards further legalization of these dreamers, these you know, younger folks typically, not over the age of 31. That's the bar, the top mm -hmm. bar age under which uh, people were allowed to uh, apply for that program, as long as they could prove that mm -hmm. they've gone to high school or some form of secondary school in the United States. Uh, but uh, this comprehensive immigration reform package uh, was not negotiated and they did not arrive at a deal. And that's why uh, the Trump administration then uh, dropped their interest in the dreamers uh, originally. What does that mean? They dropped their uh, interest in them. They, they were no longer in favor of uh, trying to provide further legalization for the individuals that were in this Dreamer DACA program uh, and uh, that they wanted to actually close the program from uh, basically preventing new students or young people from applying for it. So they didn't. Did they drop it or not then? Uh, they did drop interest in it, and then there were lawsuits that were filed. Uh, 
and the U.S. Supreme Court in 2019 ah, right, right. Uh, decided against uh, the Trump administration's uh, solicitor general in the lawsuit and indicated that the uh, that the method by which they were trying to drop the program was done incorrectly. It required more notice and that there were certain uh, legislative hurdles and procedural hurdles that needed to be faced before the program could be formally dropped. And so it is not dropped. So it has not been dropped. And since uh, the new administration has come into power on January 20th, uh, the, uh, the, the new president actually signed an extension of the program. Oh, good. And yeah. uh, part of the, uh, the goal eventually is to uh, not limit these young people, these dreamers uh, to what they have now, which are just these work permit cards, nothing more than that, which allows right. them to work and continue on towards uh, higher education if they choose to and get social security numbers. Uh, but the, the goal that the Biden administration has, if, the, if it's passed, is to uh, actually uh, put forth a path towards US citizenship for these people. So, uh, so, so what's, what's, what's Biden trying to do? So what's, what's been proposed, uh, and I'm quoting here, it's called the, the US Citizenship Act of 2021. That's what the, uh, this uh, comprehensive immigration uh, reform program is referred to. Uh, basically, if uh, what this has to do now, again, this requires congressional approval, like anything else, it's not something that the president's going to be able to uh, do via uh, executive action. What the president has done via executive action is, as Sandy mentioned, number one is cease further construction of the wall. Uh, we just talked about making DACA the law of the land, not through legislation, but by executive action. So that's been extended. Uh, the other thing that the, uh, the new president, the administration has been able to do is to end the so-called presidential proclamation uh, signed by, by uh, President Trump in 2000, I wanna say 18, early 18, which commonly in the press has been referred to as the Muslim ban. Right. Uh, you know, even though there were a number of countries on it that were that do not have predominantly Muslim populations, but that's yeah, like Venezuela. How, how, as well, North Korea for a period of time, Belarus yeah. uh, was on it. Uh, so there are some uh, countries that do, do not have uh, uh, large demographics of uh, uh, Muslim populations in their in their citizenry. Uh, but uh, the president, the new president was able to essentially tear up that proclamation uh, that uh, placed uh, people from some of these select countries it's not all Islamic countries. It was a select group of countries and uh, essentially uh, ex um, require prospective immigrants to uh, enhance scrutiny during the immigration process. Right. Right. Uh, you know, and uh, that, that, that has since ceased as of January 21st of this year, a couple of days ago. Uh, so that has been done by executive order, but some of the bigger, uh, bigger goals uh, that the Biden administration has under this U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021 is uh, one is to make these the the Dreamers uh, give to give them green cards through an ex expedited process uh, as long as they're able to uh, pass background searches show that they paid their taxes and have not gotten into any kind of legal trouble uh, they want to provide these uh, young folks a a, a, a easier quicker, narrower path towards uh, US citizenship uh, pretty quickly. They also want to uh, try to provide a path towards citizenship right. for the undocumented. All uh, the undocumented? The, the idea, yeah. So we're wow. talking about uh, now, and I'm including the folks that, uh, that have come here legally through visas and then uh -huh. later the visas expired, as well as the dreamers. The numbers estimates, as we talked about earlier, are close to about 11 to 12 million people. So all so, undocumented. Is essentially, what yes. All, all, all individuals that, you know, we used to call illegal, unauthorized, undocumented, uh, that entire uh, class of, of, uh, of, if you want to use the term immigrant, 
uh, would essentially be put on a path towards citizenship after five years. They would have to pay the taxes, go undergo background searches uh, to confirm that they are not, uh, that they don't have criminal backgrounds. And if they continue that for five years, they would then be given the opportunity to apply for green cards. Remember we talked about green yeah. card holders as permanent residents. And right. then if they get their green cards, they would then after five years be eligible to apply for American citizenship. Uh, so it's, it's gonna be a very difficult program to pass. Uh, you're talking about 11 to 12 million people. Right. It's probably the most sweeping immigration reform right that's been passed since, uh, believe it or not, it was the Reagan administration that gave the largest blanket amnesty in recent history in 1986 when President Reagan legalized 3 million undocumented uh, individuals uh, and put them on a path towards citizenship. But not since then has there been the political will and bipartisan action on the part of any president since then to legalize this large class of uh, individuals. There have been attempts by President George W. Bush in 2006, and uh, the proceedings uh, fell apart uh, in, in the House, uh, largely due to, his, uh, to uh, a lot of blowback that, he, that the president received from his own party members at that time. And then there was a second attempt uh, through a bill that was uh, co-sponsored by then uh, Senators uh, John McCain and Ted Kennedy right. in Massachusetts. And in 2013, that was under the o Obama administration. And uh, similarly, it passed the Senate, uh, but it failed to achieve approval in the House. Uh, so what? Um, so a lot of people have talked about the fact that this is a pretty risky prospect that Biden seems to be focused on as his signature uh, attempted achievement right from the get-go uh, to uh, try to get comprehensive immigration reform. And what's different between uh, the, uh, the approaches that President Obama followed or pursued and the approach that President George W. Bush um, attempted to pursue was that there isn't a complementary complementary a uh, border security plan that's yeah. being offered as um, as bait for right. Right. people uh, you know Democrats and Republicans that are on the right are are in states that are typically you know what we know as red states that may right. be not in favor there's it's always been a difficult uh, conversation even President Trump when there was initial talk about comprehensive immigration reform, you know, the condition that he put up was that, you know, we need to strike a balance between border security and and comprehensive immigration reform. And that right. once we struck that balance, that we could have that conversation. And uh, during the prior administration, uh, a big part of that discussion was trying to actually erect that wall across the entire southern border first, before there was any meaningful conversation about uh, immigration reform uh, with respect to benefits uh -huh. being, being given out. So, uh, you know, that, that there wasn't the bipartisan will to do that in the last administration. So that didn't happen. But this time around, uh, the, uh, the new president is, uh, is attempting to uh, put through this, this program. Massive. It's a massive. It's a massive program. And uh, so, the, the conversation in the immigration legal community, even though it's gotten a lot of people that are on the receiving end very excited right. about what this could mean, is, uh, you know, the, the politics involved here is, uh, you know, the country is at a high uh, unemployment rate right now because of lockdowns uh, due to right. COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. And, um there's, there's gonna be a lot of resistance that we will see in the Congress from both sides of the political aisle, I think, especially in states that have inordinately high unemployment, right. stating that, you know, we, how are we in a position to bring in more people when the people that we have here already, uh, which is, you know, which is an age old argument, uh, but uh, in this case, you know, it may be a, uh, 
a, a, a dispositive argument in some, if the, if the, if the plan fails uh, in that, uh, how do we account for this when we have so many people here that are unemployed right. to pass a program like this? Uh, the president is, and the, and the Democratic Party in trying to push this through, uh, I don't believe has, simply has enough votes yeah, uh, even right, within its right. own party to right. put something right. as ambitious as this. Right. There, there is a possibility that some of the other goals uh, that this Comprehensive Immigration Reform Act uh, consists of could happen. Uh, it's a possibility that perhaps the dreamers may receive some forms of benefits uh, that uh, will go closer to, you know, a path towards citizenship. You know, other aspects of this, you know, reform, which we didn't talk about, is the president wants to talk. Uh, it's it's actually a program that R Mitt Romney, when he ran for president, uh, brought up. It was basically to give any foreign student who is in a U.S. doctoral program in a STEM field, essentially oh, yeah. give them, basically hand out green cards to them. Right. Uh, you know, with very little effort. And that's certainly something that the president uh, in this um New Citizenship Act, this Comprehensive Immigration Reform Package, has also brought up as uh, as a possibility of, of doing. I think there's there may be political will to uh, incrementally uh, provide uh, benefits for certain classes of individuals, yeah, but without going through a reconciliation budgetary process or killing the uh, uh, you know, I know we're getting a little bit in the weeds here, but, you know, killing the filibuster, the Senate filibuster, it's going to be an awfully difficult endeavor uh, to succeed in this, uh, in this, you know, in this uh, uh, immigration reform push right. that the president's put forth. It's so, well, in this, in this uh, time as well, with so much unemployment. So with so much unemployment, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, the uh, the Democrats have talked about the use of the the, the reconciliation process in the budget, is, yeah, through and passing this and putting the immigration uh, bill as part of a larger uh, COVID nineteen slash um, uh, relief right. uh, package and make it part of the budget. The re the way they would justify it as part of the reconciliation process since they have to show that uh, any any legislation has an impact on revenues and tax spending uh, is that uh, the, the means that they would accomplish this by is by showing that when these individuals who would be benefiting from from legalization when they when they are legalized they will be able to add to the tax base and pay taxes and then in the process, they would also be paying some hefty application fees, uh, which would uh, basically add to the uh, as a, as a plus to the uh, to the budget uh, mm -hmm. for a government agency like the Department of Homeland Security or the USCIS or ICE. Wow. So, uh, but even in in that situation, whether it's uh, through the reconciliation budgetary process or an attempt to uh, enact cloture uh, by closing off uh, the uh, filibuster arguments. Yeah. Uh, it's going to require, you know, almost uh, the, the entire Democratic Party will have to vote in unison with uh, very little luxury of anyone breaking ranks right. for such an ambitious project to, uh, to actually come into being. Right. So I wanted to then open this up to questions without, yeah. you know, I can talk hours about this stuff. Who has a question, anyone? And we well, can go back to, you know, any anything, immigration categories, green cards, visas. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Lou. Yeah, I just, um, I remember uh, when I was working at VEIC, we had a people uh, that we hired had an H-1B visa. Now, are there different right. subcategories of visas yeah, so, then? And yeah, they so, different things. Right, right. So the H-1B visa category, that falls under the ca the, 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 uh, the big category that I brought up of non-immigrant visas. So mm -hmm. an H-1B, you know, non-immigrant, meaning that they can't stay here forever. H-1B okay. visas are good for three years and you can mm -hmm. renew, renew them one more time for an additional three years. Then you have to go back to your home country uh, and then you can apply for it again after staying there for a year or two. Unless, okay. unless your employer 
while you have this H-1B visa, this temporary work, it's a work visa, it's right. been, it, mostly used by folks these days in the high tech field. And don't mm -hmm. ask me why, uh, fashion models come into <laughs> this category too. Uh, I don't know how that worked in Congress, but when the category was created, those were the, basically the two main uh, areas of employment that it covers. Uh, but it, it is a temporary category and it is a work visa uh, and it comes under non-immigrant visas. And it's also, um, you know, there's a lot of question about, you know, whether a lot of times individuals are properly interviewed at the consulates, whether they actually have the qualifications to do the jobs. There's a lot of scams that go on. I've actually been party to clients that have come here with H-1B visas and they, they found out that there was no employer. Mm. Uh, so they, they, they left their employment, families elsewhere and came here thinking that they were starting, you know, 50 to $70,000 a year jobs. And they find mm -hmm. out that, uh, that the employer physically was not here. Oh. Uh, they paid some individual in their home country, a lot of money to apply for the program. And then, uh, then they're basically here and doing, you know, work that's not in their area of specialty mm -hmm. or expertise. And then they become uh, illegal in the process mm -hmm. or unauthorized. Is anybody else? Well, I One just thing. had a, I oh, just I'm had sorry, a, go ahead, Joanne. Well, I just had a question. I know that every, in the summers, uh, one sees many young people working at the Cape um, and here at the mountains at and the, yeah, the ski time. In the lake. Uh, on the lake, yes, sure. and um, I wondered if, when I didn't see as many this past summer or hear of them and wondered whether Trump had uh -uh. changed things enough that uh, they weren't allowed to come. Is that a program that, that does that uh, follow with the B, what, what was the name of the, the H1. number? H1. H1B, no, no. So typically H1B, again, these days, uh, you know, the, the categories of employment that we're typically familiar with are mostly folks in the computer and tech IT industry. And as I mentioned, fashion models, uh, they, they fall within that category of H-1B visas. The, the category that you talk about, I live up here in Bolton Valley. Right. Uh, and uh, so every year you know, that I've been living here for the past 14 years, we get young students either from Peru or I shouldn't call them they happen to be students, but the, yeah, but that's not a, a, a qualifier. Yeah. But uh, the young people that come from either Peru or Chile or other countries in South America, and they work at the ski resorts. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once ski season is over, they typically a week or two before that, they go back. And I understand, you know, that's the case at Stowe, at Sugarbush, and uh, a number of other Vermont ski resorts, as well as uh, this places in the summer, as, as you mentioned, yeah. you know, that you'll see people in Burlington, other parts of the country, they'll be working at uh, amusement parks. Uh, these are what, what are, and au pairs, yeah. you know, childcare uh, providers, au pairs, they fall under that category. And the category is called J-1 visas. Mm -hmm. uh, so the president, um, there, was, there was some impetus on the part of the prior administration to reduce that category uh, significantly uh, of people that come on a J-1 visa. And, uh, However, combined with what happened with the COVID pandemic and lockdowns, um, you know, these, individ these programs were shut down largely internally from the, their own countries, preventing these students from going abroad and then possibly, you know, having an issue with an infection and coming back. So it was not formally closed off by the Trump administration. The, the thing about the J-1 visa, that is. Right, but what Joanne was saying is interesting because much of our tourist industry, uh, including foreign tourists, has been really destroyed by COVID. And, and people, yeah. and, you know, it's not really uh, the Trump administration that did no. that. It was, it was the whole pandemic that did that, including now. I mean, you, if you're going to come to Vermont as a tourist, or yeah. in the United States, you have to quarantine for 14 days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the just to clarify, yeah, the the, the prior administration's focus was on uh, immigration, right. by, and by immigration, I mean you know individuals that wanted to permanently settle here. 
there there weren't any curbs on tourists right. coming to the United States exactly. unless they came unless they came from a couple of the countries in that presidential proclamation uh, 9645 that uh, pr stopped you know majority Muslim countries as well as uh, North Korea Venezuela Belarus and a few other places I think Belarus was then later taken off but a few other places those tourists from those countries were excluded from entry into the United States without you know a lot of a lot of you know uh, haggling and a lot of uh, uh, exemptions and waivers that would have to be secured. Uh, the, pri the prior administration's focus was more on permanent immigration. Well, also the prior administration, although they didn't start this practice, they got a lot of well-deserved heat about the fact that as people came into this country illegally, their families were separated. Yeah, so I mean, uh, the, the, the administration, uh, it was, it, was a, it was a plan that was actually hashed by uh, the attorney general at that time. Uh, it didn't come from the president or even Stephen Miller, his immigration guru, so to speak. Uh, it was hatched by uh, the, the attorney general, Jeff Sessions, the former senator from Alabama, mm -hmm. uh, who came up with the program and they called it Zero Tolerance. Right. Uh, the, uh, the Zero Tolerance program was... Uh, designed to uh, basically um, essentially shock and awe individuals that were crossing in. Now, you know, again, we talked about a, a couple of different categories of people that are considered, you know, unauthorized right. uh, immigrants in the country, but this was specifically targeting individuals that were physically crossing in from the, uh, the Southern border of the United States from Mexico uh, and uh, large numbers of which were, came from uh, originally from Central America, but also, you know, uh, large numbers from, from Mexico itself. And uh, they started a policy of separating the families, uh, which again, that wasn't new. Uh, right. I know that there was a lot of politics. I, the, the part that, that was new in, 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 in the process was the fact that Typically in the past, when the children were separated, uh, because they usually don't incarcerate children, they were put in foster homes uh, with foster families until there was some kind of uh, disposition as to the, uh, the immigration or deportation right. removal case. Uh, what happened differently in this case was that the children were also incarcerated in separate facilities. And the... Uh, the um, outrage that uh, that a lot of the American public, especially the legal community, expressed was that the uh, the conditions at these centers uh, where the children were being held were inhumane. So those were the allegations, and uh, mm -hmm. there are still investigations going on against. Uh, at this point, the focus has been more on the individuals who have hatched, who were responsible for hatching the program namely the initial attorney general that President Trump had with Jeff Sessions and his group. Really? So the litigation is against Sessions? That's correct. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, again, the thinking was that this would uh, be uh, so problematic and upsetting towards individuals, migrants who cross the border to the, the, the prospect of, yeah, the prospect of not just being separated from the children, but the children being essentially incarcerated in uh, difficult conditions that they wouldn't come. Right, right. Does anybody else have, a, have any further questions? I just have one before we uh, wrap up and that is, uh, I think President Biden also said he was gonna halt deportations for a hundred days, correct? Yeah, uh, I yeah. think uh, there, there was, uh, that, that was his, uh, that was an executive order that he signed. Yes. yes. Uh, within 24 hours of being inaugurated. Right. Uh, uh, 24 hours uh, within the inauguration date. Uh, however, uh, again, it's, you know, most of these things are litigated. Uh, he's, ex the president's experienced a glitch in that order. Uh, there's a, a lower federal court judge who has um, right. basically intervened and is putting a stay on the executive order's application so that the deportations and removals uh, that take place that have already been ordered by immigration judges will continue. So this is probably going to go up the, the, the legal, the judicial chain 
to uh to the uh, to the appellate level. Okay. Well, anybody else have any questions? No. Um, I did think of of, of one other thing. So. Yeah. Historically, also, I mean, I would love to explore immigration in historical ways. There were times when, for instance, the Chinese were excluded. Sure. Um, and there were times when the unskilled were excluded. Ben and, Franklin, Ben Franklin didn't like Germans. Right. Well, right. there's no Germ. Well, yeah, there are some Germans here, actually. Grads, mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. I am too. But that's true about the Germans. But of course, they were they were the adversary at least in two wars was that the oh, time? right now i'm talking yeah. about benjamin franklin right okay was right. against uh yeah he was against german immigration because uh he thought that the ethnic nature of the country would change really no, because mm -hmm. they were different they spoke a different language yeah, and that the language would change also from english correct to german, correct right? yeah so yeah i mean historically yeah there have been waves of immigration right. and there have been waves of anti-immigration then there have right. been waves of anti-immigration uh, directed at certain ethnic groups, right. like right. the Chinese that you mentioned. Right, right, right. And some of that has been labeled at least anti-Catholic as well, right? Sure, yeah. That, that the Irish were punished by those kinds Correct. of Correct. Also. But anyway, it is, I would, I'd be very interested to know even the history of immigration, because of course we are a country still of immigrants. I mean, that's yeah. not immigrants and people who, were forcibly emigrated from there from the continent of Africa. So right, I right. mean, it, it was anyway. So maybe that. So, I mean, some people would, you know, it's an interesting conversation. So you know, right. you have you have people arguing in favor of it because of the diversity that it adds right. to our country and communities, and then you have the business communities. Uh, well, they've also basically, uh, in some, in, on many levels, have been the secret sauce to American success, because there's always been this constant supply of cheap labor. Right. Whether right. originally it was from Europe, you know, then it moved on to other, you know, South America, Asia, Africa. Well, but we had the cheapest form of labor of all, and that was slavery. Slavery, right. But the, once once that, you right. know, ended right. after the 13th Amendment, right. the Civil War, right. uh, you know, the, the industrialization of this country required large amounts of labor right. and cheap labor where you know the Europeans didn't have that luxury, they were not necessarily you know immigration destinations. If anything, that's where people left from, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they also, as a result, often had to pass a lot of legislation in their countries that were more more pro worker, more more pro labor, mm -hmm. because uh, you know they didn't have people that were willing to work for nothing that just came, you know, came to our shores. Right. So uh, industry has benefited greatly over the uh, past couple of centuries by always having this cheap supply. Right. And even in the within the Republican Party, just as an ending point, you know, where there there have been clashes in the last two decades about, you know, whether or not we should have let more people in. The business end of the Republican Party has always been in favor of continuing right. the supply of cheap labor uh, and even moderately priced labor, while you'll have, you know, the working classes that are, uh, you know, Republican look at that as, you know, a means to keep wages down by right, continuing well, no, to have cheap the, labor. The working class that you're talking about, the ones that would oppose immigration, yeah. because of the wage thing, are largely, I think, I would guess, in the Democratic Party. That think, used to be. Used it to used be. to be, yeah. I think there, you know, I think that's, there's been a, you know, a paradigm shift yeah. the past couple of decades, but we're probably going off topic right now. Right. Yeah. But anyway, anybody else have any further things to say? Uh, if not, I guess we'll wrap up for the evening and thank Kurt a lot and we'll yeah. in, in a week or so, right? Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Later. Bye-bye.